So it is now one o'clock, so we'll make a start. So as I said, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Wallace Collection Online and welcome to today's talk as a part of our Meet the Experts series, Collecting Treasures, Grunsgewölbe in Dresden and the Wallace Collection. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by both Ada de Witt of the Wallace Collection and Theresa Witting of the Grunsgewölbe in Dresden. And I'll be handing over to them both in a few moments time, but before we get started, just a few small bits of housekeeping as always. Uh, so firstly, if you're joining us via Zoom, um, please submit your questions via either the Q&A or the chat function, and we will have a little time at the end to answer those. Um, or if you're watching along on YouTube, again, please uh, submit questions via the chat function there. Uh, although we are monitoring the chat function on, on YouTube, we're not responsible for any comments. So uh, please make sure that all your comments are appropriate for the audience. Um, that's about it, really. Uh, without any further ado, oh, excuse me, rather, uh, if you're watching along on Zoom, you can also enjoy a uh, closed captioning service for this talk, uh, which should be as standard on YouTube as well. Uh, so with all of that out of the way, please allow me to hand over to Adam Witt and uh, Theresa Witting for today's talk. Uh, thank you so much, Ali, and good afternoon. And I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Theresa Witting, who studied art history and history in Innsbruck and Hamburg. And her thesis was on 16th century enameled altarpieces from Limoges. She was curatorial fellow at the Staatliche Kunstsammlungen Dresden between 2007 and 2009, and curated the exhibition Fascination of Fragility, Masterpieces of European Porcelain of the 18th century on the occasion of the 300th anniversary of Meissen. That was in Berlin in 2010. And since 2014, she's been collaborating with Dr. Ulrike Weinhold on the project Gold and Silver of the 16th to 18th centuries at the Dresden Court as an instrument of royal prestige at the Grunsgewölbe. And within this project, they've published a few books on original paints on gold and silver and on silver gifts and silver buffets at the Dresden Court. So Teresa, I'm very grateful that you agreed to join me. Um, the Staatliche Kunstsammlungen Dresden, so Dresden State Art Collections and the Wallace Collection are very different museums, but what connects us is the concept of a Kunstkammer and, we, and various uh, works of art that, are, that we have in common. And we will begin uh, with a short introduction to the Kunstkammer and we'll explain what that is. Then Teresa will take us on a tour of the Grunas Gavulba in Dresden. And after that, I will talk about Sir Richard Wallace's collection of treasures. And at the end, we will discuss some of the objects which we have in common. So Teresa, what is a Kunstkammer? What does it mean? <laughs> Ada, first of all, thank you for the invitation and, for, and thank you for the introduction. Um, starting with the terminology is a good point um, and it's a, and, and then strangely enough, it's a German term. So Kunst und Wunderkammer, uh, as Kunst for art, Wunder for wonder or curiosities. Maybe we could um, translate it with um, cabinet of curiosities in English. And it's really, um, it's a, a European phenomenon and at about 1550 to 1600 that these sort of collections arose in Europe, but um, especially popular they were in, in in German speaking countries. So, um, and they have, as the term says, they, they have quite a complex concept or complex meaning that it, 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 they don't only show um, art in its proper sense, but a lot of wonders or curiosities. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because today I think we think about art cabinets, we think about these works of art, but that was just one of the many aspects of the Kunstkammer, right? Because yes, they consisted of precious artworks called artificialia, but there are also rare natural objects, naturalia. And here I have, I have a picture of the kind of cabinet of natural wonders. And you see various stuffed animals, birds, and even that crocodile <laughs> on top and various shells. But there are also scientific instruments uh, called uh, scientificia and objects from different continents, exotica, also items relating to history and even natural curiosities such as unicorns horn, uh, horns or even like objects that were believed to be related to mythical creatures. So a Kunstkammer I think was very much an encyclopedic collection that reflected the state of knowledge of that period. 
And I think we can say that it's like a predecessor of a modern museum. Yes, for sure. Ada, just if you if you go to the next slide, maybe, um, because yeah. for, for us, this is a, a little Kunstkammer. Um, um, for us, it looks like a little bit chaotic, maybe just as a as a juxtaposition of, of a deliberate juxtaposition of, of, of several objects. But for the contemporaries, there was a clear order. It was a sort of cosmos, it's sort of a hidden network between between all these uh, all these items. I think this is uh, this is also important um, to say. And that the, for the contemporaries, the the emphasis lie clearly on on wonders. So yes. it, on the curiosities. Mm. Yes, and you mean the juxtaposition of like works of art and the natural natural pieces, yeah. like yeah. In this in this uh, painting, great. And yeah, you mean like they? So um, they? Yes. We should, <laughs> yes, then we should say that yeah, the people who collected this this kind of objects. I mean, they were definitely rich people, so rulers, uh, but also wealthy merchants or or scholars. And I think you will agree with me that the kind of the Kunstkammer was very much like a statement of power, right? Because it was, the, yes, indeed, the st status of power. It was um, it was an instrument of power to show to show off also with their wealth and with their knowledge, and 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 it's for sure that man the man is able to subdue nature by showing this artificial. I guess it's a very important aspect as well. All right. Okay, so um, that's the Kunstkammer. We'll discuss it, I mean, further. But I just thought that it would be great if you could introduce us to, to your museum <laughs> and tell yes. us about, yeah, your collection. Yes, maybe we just start, uh, Ada, with the, with the map. Yes. Just to show where we are. Um, yes, maybe it's quite interesting to, to, to be more concrete. So I show you a map around 1800. Uh, of Europe, and you see this uh, colored, um, this red colored territory. This is the electorate of Saxony. Um, and what does electorate mean? It means um, the elector of Saxony, the Kurfürst in German. He is, he was able, or he he could uh, elect the Holy Roman Emperor. So the electors of Saxony had quite a uh, played an important role within the Holy Roman Empire, and they were quite wealthy. They had the silver mines and, and they wanted to show their wealth. And one way of showing their wealth for sure is, is also collecting. So maybe we just be more concrete and go to the, to the Kunst und Wunderkammer, a bit, a bit told, yes, we, we spoke about. And you have to imagine that every Kunstkammer is unique. Every Kunstkammer has a special emphasis. And we know from Dresden, because I tell you, we know because there is no Kunstkammer anymore. We will talk about this later, but there's no Kunstkammer. It was dissolved in the 19th century. But as we know from the inventories, from the first inventory of 1587, and this was the first inventory Elector August erected, and we know that 80% of the whole collection was, um, was dedicated to tools instruments, technical instruments, optical instruments, mathematics. So this reflects the, the interest of the, of the elector. And what, what I show now, just to give you a glance, is um, some years ago, the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden opened um, a permanent exhibition, which is called Concept and Encounter, the world around 1600. And this reflects on the, on the Kunstkammer, on the Dresden Kunstkammer. I mean, I love the gardening tools. And I have to say that when I uh, went to Dresden, that was the biggest surprise for me because, uh, I mean, I didn't expect to see gardening tools in the <laughs> art movie. But also, I mean, I was really amazed that they still, that they survived. I mean, yes. sixth century gardening tools. Yes, yes. As, as I told you, the, they were very important. This was high technology at the time. And we know that the elector and his wife, Anna of Denmark, they were very interested in, in gardening. And this and it's also this means also a benefit for their territory because they wanted to to grow new plants, have new ideas. So this is uh, the collection is not only to be looked at, but this was a collection to to work with. So uh -huh. this um, yes, they they were this, this was some sort of models. So these gardening tools they were used. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, and that's then the Kunstkammer, right? But then the Grunes Gewölbe is not a Kunstkammer. Technically, it's not, right? So could you explain no. different collections in Dresden? Yes, yes, Ada. Uh, there is a sort of landscape of collections um, in this time in Dresden. So the, the, the Kunstkammer was in the residence, in mm -hmm. the residence in Dresden and as the other collections. So um, uh, what is important is, the, is the, to, to explain now the Grunes Gewölbe. What is the Grünes Gewölbe? Yes, <laughs> the Grünes Gewölbe is, um, is a Schatzkammer. This means it is a treasury or a treasure chamber. It means it's a total different um, concept. The, the Schatzkammer at the very beginning was, was secret. The, the German term is the Geheime Verwahrung des Grünen Gewölbes. This means the secret repository of the Green Vault. And why it is called Green Vault? If you look at this picture, this is the the, the main, the main um, room of the green vault, it was painted green. So, and this is why it's called the green vault. So it is still in existence, the green vault, the historic green vault, there are two, but I, I'm talking about the historic green vault in the ground floor of the, of the residence. And maybe just to give you a notion, to give you an idea what it is, we I show you some slides. Let's okay. start. So um, you sure. have, to, you have to, yes. So I told you at the beginning in the 16th century, the, 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 the Schatzkammer was secret. It was locked away. Uh, and why was it secret? Because it housed important documents for the, for the electors, jewels and goldsmith work. So these were not seen to, for seen, um, not to be seen for, for the public. So it were locked away. But we are now in the 18th century. So we are, this is the time of another elector, which is quite, who is quite important. It's um, Elector August the Strong, um, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland. And he changed the landscape of, um, of collections completely. He created new collections. He took things out of the Kunstkammer. He created the painting gallery, the sculpture gallery. And what he did, he enlarged the green world. And what, what, what we see now, or what the visitor can so, ho hopefully soon see, see uh, again, is a uh, barockes Gesamtkunstwerk. So I say it's a, um, what, what is the English term for a Gesamtkunstwerk? It's like, like a total work of art. Total work of art, exactly. Right. <laughs> so this means it's not only, not only the, the objects are important, but also the display. So the, the, the brackets, you see the little brackets, you see the walls. So we start here with the ivory room. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Dresden is famous uh, for, his, uh, for his, it's carved and turned ivory. Oh, yes. So here, here are the examples, right? <laughs> here are the examples. And, and, and you also have to imagine that this, um, this turning ivory is, is a very demanding skill. It's very complicated to, to work the lathe. Mm -hmm. um, and it was even part of the princely education. So, and there was a workshop for uh, the elector August appointed two um, artists working in the residence for, for the elector. And he produced, this is um, Egidius Lobinek. He produced this sort of geometrical um, objects. They are quite complicated to make. Oh, that, I mean, they, they look complicated. I mean, I absolutely love them. We, we have ivories in the Wallace collection, but no examples of turned ivory. And to me, they look so abstract. They're like modern. Modern, very yeah. modern. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fabulous. So shall we then continue? Yes, we can more? go right from the ivory room into the white silver room. So mm -hmm. um, you, you see the, the environment changes. There are mirrors, the, 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 the color is red. So this is the white silver room. That means the surface is, is only, I say, only white silver. But if we step into the next room, you could just see the green, just the green um, walls. Yes, this is the silver gilt room. So the surface is different. It's silver gilt, and 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 the, the mirrors do increase. Um, um, it's 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 green now. And what do you see? That some brackets are are empty. It means what do you see is not the total um, collection of, of, of silver we, we originally had. It's only a small part because in 1772, many parts were melted down because it was, there was a need for money after the Seven Years' War in the 18th century. So uh, many parts were melted down, but there are still some objects left for our silver catalog. 
Oh yes, of course. And, but okay. how about the, and how about the interiors? Because um, we know that Dresden was badly uh, destroyed during the Second World War. So are, what we see, is it like original or is it reconstruction? Partly, partly, partly. Partly original. Is it, for sure, the, the objects are all all original, but some of the mirrors are redone, some of the um, walls are redone, but they are um, there are some parts who are original. So this is the next uh, the next room is the hall of the precious objects. So it's one the first climax, maybe we say. And if you if you remember this column in the middle, this was the one with the with the green color on it. So now it's covered with with mirrors, but this is the heart of the green wall, the hall of the precious um, object. Maybe you just look at, at, at the other slide. You see this um, this ostrich eggs. This this. Oh, sorry. No, it's, that's okay. Uh, just keep in mind, we will talk about it later. Okay, it's out. Okay, we can go. Just cool down a little bit. <laughs> Calm down. We, we come to the coat of arms room um, to see uh, the, this copper gilt um, coat of arms of the electorate of Saxony. Take a deep breath and then uh, go in, right into the jewels room. So this is maybe the highlight. This is the state treasury of, of Saxony as it was. Um, the nine jewel sets um, um, commissioned by, by August the Strong. So this is, yes, the highlight we have. And the showcases are our original 18th century. And then, and then calm okay. down a little bit again, and then we go to, to, to the bronzes room. And then we, yes, we are at the end of our little virtual tour. So Teresa, could you show us some typical objects of Grunus Gewölbe? Yes, uh, there is the, the choice is not so easy, but yes, I can show you. Maybe next, yes, maybe the one, the most, yes, the most famous one maybe here uh, is the, the so-called the throne of the Grand Mogul um, Aurangzeb, made by the court jeweler of August the Strong, Johann Melchior und Inglinger, with his brothers, with his family, with his workshop, um, at the beginning of the 18th century. And uh, it, it costed an enormous sum. And you have to imagine that uh, the, um, the Dinglingers, uh, they had no commission by August the Strong. They, they just made it on their own risk. So, uh, so, so, all right. So they just created it knowing that the elector would acquire it. So it was just completely... <laughs> yes, risky business, but I think they knew that, he, that, that the elector would not refuse. So um, yes, it's it's a very it's, you see all these precious materials, this gold, precious stones, enamel. Yes, it's um it's very very um. And could you tell us what the scale of it is? Because I mean, it's not easy to see in that picture. But yes, that, that's I'm being very big. <laughs> it it is quite big. It's uh, the area is about one meter forty by one meter uh, 15 and the high is about 58 centimeters so it's quite it's quite big i just i think i have one detail to oh, show yeah. it is one elephant yes you can see that it's made of gold covered with enamels and precious stones so it's it's, it's a very high level work yeah, very yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely wonderful and then i think we have one more right oh yeah it's this one yeah, this is uh, another work. It's it's a little bit earlier. It's um, from the uh, end of the of the 16th century, and it's done in in Nuremberg. But not only in Nuremberg. Um, Ada, if you take the next slide, please. We look uh, we look closely at the basin, and it's made of wood, and it's covered with these um, plaques of mother of pearl. It's made in in Gujarat in India. So they they. They bought the, the basin and in Nuremberg, it was mounted by, by, by Niklas Schmidt with, with, with silver gilt. Um, yes, and during our project, um, we had a restoration because it was quite dirty and the conservator took off the mountings, the mountings and, and we had a little surprise if we, if we look at the back of the basin. So we discovered uh, the original um, Indian painting, which was also made in uh, in India in the 16th century, and they were they are still lively, they are still colorful uh, as they are in the in the in the 16th century. But uh, now again, after the restoration, it it was for sure covered with uh, with the silver mounts. Wow, wonderful! And when does it come to the collection? 
it yes it, it's it's uh, it's an it's an early piece it's uh, come around about around 1600 and it was original in the kunstkammer so um and then Augustus Strong put it in the in the green vault and as i told you at the beginning that the kunstkammer do not did not survive and because it was dissolved and at the end of um in 1832 Yes, because I mean, in the 19th century, there was um, that fashion for Kunstkammer objects, and that actually leads us nicely to uh, Sir Richard Wallace and the Wallace collection. Uh, Sir Richard Wallace, yeah, 19th century uh, collector, one of the founders of our museum, of the Wallace collection, and he was a great collector of Kunstkammer objects. Uh, he was not the only one uh, that it was, as I mentioned, it was a fashion and I could mention uh, Ferdinand de Rothschild, another uh, important collector who um, acquired very similar objects. Uh, but that was not a Kunstkammer in the Renaissance sense because they collected art, but not naturalia. So we don't have any stuffed crocodiles in the Wallace collection. Uh, so it's in a way a 19th century interpretation of a Kunstkammer, or some people call it a neo Kunstkammer. Uh, but yeah, Wallace loved this kind of ex small, exquisite objects made of precious um, materials. And I particularly like this photograph that shows Wallace handling a bronze statuette. And yeah, the, the Kunstkammer objects, I think that they're kind of pieces you really want to handle, you want to touch them. Um, right, so they, for those who know the Wallace collection, uh, it will probably associate mainly with French 18th century art, and indeed um, our state rooms displayed a kind of art, and that was collected mainly by Wallace's predecessors. Uh, and here you see um, a photograph of the back state room. But then, what Wallace had in his more private rooms were the kind of Kunstkammer pieces. And you see the display is very different. So this is a 16th century room, which is a part of the today's 16th century gallery. And this is Wallace's study. And if you look closely, uh, you will see that cabinet behind his desk. The picture is a bit blurry, but I do recognize all this Renaissance uh, 16th, but also 17th century pieces of silver. And if you look uh, down, there's on the lower shelf, you see the very characteristic shape. It's, it's a silver statuette of an ostrich, which I will show you in a few minutes. And here is a painting I really wanted to show you. Uh, it's in Karlsruhe in, in Kunsthalle. And that shows a selection of Wallace's works of art hmm. and uh, yeah I think it's just I mean it's wonderful <laughs> document for us it's other as I read the painting is not at the, at the Wallace anymore no because uh yeah I mean unfortunately <laughs> the painting was not a part of the bequest of the collection to the nation so uh, it was sold at some point but we have all the objects. Okay, really okay, good. but that's even more important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have all these pieces and it's just really, um, I mean, wonderful and just so so unique. So for instance, if you look, uh, you see on the left-hand side, there is this um, wooden statuette of Hercules, right, on, on the left. Well, here it is. And it's a very, I mean, it's a beautiful piece, but it's also incredibly important. Um, Statuettes. So it was already celebrated in the 16th century, and it was mentioned in the history of Padua of 1560, which makes the piece really exceptional as wooden sculptures were rarely documented in Renaissance sources. And it also has an inscription on the base, which uh, reads the work of Francesco Goldsmith of Padua, which is again very unique to have reference to, to the maker. Uh, so it's kind of signature. And it's also quite ironic, I think, that uh, Francesco Pomerano, he was mainly a goldsmith, but his most famous work that survives is this statue that's made um, in different material. And here I would also like to show this spectacular, spectacular basin, which uh, I go back. You see here in the background, you see the, the round shape of the, of the dish. Mm -hmm. And it's truly spectacular. I mean, there's just so much going on on the surface. There are all these different 
um, motifs. So there, there are four uh, elements that are represented, the four seasons, planets, uh, so many little, little figures. And there's this coat of arms in the center, which is of a Medici Pope, but actually it was, we, we think it's not original to the piece and it was uh, added later, probably in the 19th century. And we think that possibly to increase the value of the piece. And it was a common knowledge that Wallace, uh, he, he was very interested in the provenance of the pieces. And if he knew that the piece be belonged to an important person, he would really go for it. <laughs> All right, so um, I think now we'll move to the third part uh, in which we'll discuss some works of art which we have in common. But for now, we'll continue with Sir Richard Wallace. And yes, here you see um, two slides with silver figures of ostriches. So now the one on your right hand side is the Wallace collection piece, whereas the ostriches on your left hand side, they are in Dresden. And then in the corner, you see a coat of arms, and that's the coat of arms of Sir Richard Wallace. And it's important to say that Wallace was not only an art collector, but he was also a great philanthropist. In 1872, Queen Victoria had made him a baronet in recognition of his charitable work. And the coat of arms, which he was granted, included an ostrich's head with a horseshoe. And after that, in the same year, this figure appeared on the art market. So I can only imagine that he must have been like really delighted. Uh, it's pure coincidence. But then it's, what was also nice, it's not just a figure of the ostrich, which happens that features in his coat of arms, but it's also a really important piece by a very good silversmith. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has an interesting history. It was made in Augsburg, but we know that it belonged to an a brotherhood, a society of an ostrich in Aldorf in Switzerland. Um, so yeah, there was a group of men who would meet and it was more like a kind of social club and they would meet and drink and <laughs> entertain because yeah, I mean, this kind of figures are often seen as drinking vessels. And um, I see that yours are described as such as well and i'm just also curious because we have five <laughs> so where the statue is really uh, of the ostrich that's popular yes no we, we have now have five but we had ten originally ten. we had ten of these ostriches and as you said uh, they were, were drinking vessels in this case i'm not sure whether they were used because if you look um the cup is made of an ostrich egg so it's quite fragile i think you can't drink out of it the uh, it's mm. not it's not sealed so but you can take off the head and normally but yours i think if it's if it's go silver gilt then you can drink out of it that's no problem and but there is a nice story um our ostriches also do have um the coat of arms the coat of arms of of uh, the elector of saxony of christian the first and we know that christian the first he, he was fond, fond of, these, of these birds because he, he had not only these drinking vessels, but we know from, from documents, from sources, that in 1580, two ostriches came via the Alps, via Augsburg, Venice, Venice, Augsburg, then to, to Dresden. And in Dresden, there lived two of them. We know this because in the inventory of the of the Kunstkammer of 1640, one claw or one foot is still recorded of these of these ostriches. So this is um it was um but you don't have them anymore. No, 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 it, it disappeared, but we have the, the written source that that it has been here uh, in, in the in the in the Kunstkammer, yes. So the ostriches were, were quite famous. Yeah, <laughs> and they're often depicted with a horseshoe. Uh, in their beaks and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's that story, right? That um, derived from Pliny the Elder that uh, ostriches can digest anything, including yes. metal, right? Yes, so, so uh, also a symbol of strength. Of course, mm. yes. Right, um, there is another pair of objects which we would like to show you. And again, the piece which is in the Wallace collections on your right-hand side and the Dresden pieces on, the on your left-hand side. 
And I mean, there are of course various materials represented in Kunstkammern, but for me, uh, objects cut in stone are the ultimate symbols of Kunstkammer. I mean, they're, they're minerals, naturalia, but then cut by men who, cr who created this amazing works of art. It was very difficult to cut rock crystal. Yes. It required great skill. And the objects that were created were immensely precious. Uh, and they were made not only in Europe. Uh, and here you see these two wonderful figures that were made in Ceylon, so now uh, Sri Lanka. And in fact, they were incredibly rare. There's just a small group of these rock crystal figures depicting uh, Christ. And I mean, they're much more common in ivory, but in rock crystal, no. And they were made in Ceylon, but some ended up in European Kunstkammer. And in fact, the Wallace piece uh, was probably uh, in Castle in the Kunstkammer. But then originally, they were made for newly converted locals. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, they were for, for newly converted Catholics in Sri Lanka. And this is also the reason why they came relatively late to Europe not in the 16th century, but later. So our, and this is also very special because it's not rock crystal, it's mm -hmm. garnet. And, and um, so it, is, it, it, it's a, it arises in 1725 in this, in this inventory, not before. And uh, the attributes, you see this um, sort of mirror is not original. We think that Mim had a flag maybe and the cross as symbols of Christ. And, and if you look, maybe other, if you in, in, take the next slide, you can see oh, yes. details, yes, and, and the technique is, is very different from, from European goldsmith art. Yeah, and also the way how um, precious stones are cut is, is yes. very different. And yes, it's a Christian iconography. I mean, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that uh, our piece is the Good Shepherd, and maybe it's not very clear in this picture, but actually it has a lamp on, uh, on his shoulder. And there's another lamp uh, on, on his lap and your uh, statue represents a different different type uh, Salvator Mundi right the yes, it's a, it's a savior of the world yes exactly and what I also find really interesting is that we don't know anything about these people who carve these figures right we the, the no documents we just don't know who they were and but in Europe, at the same time, there are a few workshops that also could carve in uh, rock crystal, and they had like status of celebrities. Mm -hmm. And I mean mainly the Miseroni workshop that was uh, located in Milan, but then also in Prague, and they worked for the Holy Roman emperors. And they were, like everyone wanted to have vessels carved by them in in rock crystal uh, or, or the or quartz or different different minerals they were just so fashionable right they were totally fashionable that's that's true and and other if you say the, the miseroni worked for the emperors i think it's quite interesting to stress that your piece has a, a really a good provenance in in this case it has a very good provenance because uh, it belonged to the Habsburg Emperor Rudolf II, who owned the most important, the most incredible Kunstkammer at that time. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of uh, four bowls uh, in small, smoky uh, quartz that's re recorded in early 17th century inventory uh, of his collection. And that this one is probably, well, it's, it's considered the best from that group. Yeah four bowls and there's one in Vienna there's also one in, in Munich and maybe it's not so clear here but uh, what it shows is like the grotesque mask with the open mouth <laughs> open mouth yes and, and yeah. yours is uh, the same type but it's not the it's same the same maker. type but it's not really the same artist and interesting enough um we do not have such a good provenance with our piece because this piece um, um, is is documented in in 18, 1819. So it's it's an old piece. It's around 1600, but it's it, it was um, documented in 1890. This means it has been in 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 the residence in in the collection, but not in the Kunstkammer. We think maybe that it it it's, it was in the sort of stock 
because um, normally they are mounted. So maybe they waited, they wanted to have a goldsmith to have it mounted, but it never happened. And, and then it, it came in the Kunstkammer without mounts. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what we think. We don't know, but it's likely. Yes. Well, we have another pair of objects for you. Uh, so this beautiful statuettes by Giambologna. And yes, Giambologna, I mean, the name sounds very Italian, but actually he was born in Flanders and now it's part of France. Um, and Giambologna worked for almost the whole of his career in Italy in the service of the Medici. And he became the most influential sculptor of his time. And he was famous for monumental statues and also for his elegant small bronzes statuettes, which were made in large numbers and they were dis disseminated throughout Europe and often as the diplomatic gifts. And I think that's the, that's the point. Yes, that's the point like of your <laughs> yes, yes. In Dresden, we have got uh, four of them. And they were, as you said, other that it was a that diplomatic gift. And so um, when Christian the first um, came to power in 15. Uh, 186, he received one year later, he received a, a fantastic diploma, more uh, comprises many gifts. And there were four Jambolonias, there were there were weapons, there were there were, yeah, there were a lot of things. And be, because we still have the, the lists, the packing lists of, mm -hmm. of these um of these diplomatic gifts, and, and if they come from if they come from Italy, you can imagine that there was also parmigiano, there was ham, there was olive oil. So that must have been a great surprise for the for the for the electors and 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 also horses because in, uh, Christian the, the the first really wanted to have these Italian horses for for his stable. Yeah, but also the Jambolonias. And, um, this and that's is the, all listed then. That's So, so yes. it's listed, they're documented that they also got cheese and they also got yes. wine. Yes, it's all listed down. It's, and, and they even got a second present. So in 1587 and in 1500, by, by, by whom? By the um, Grand Dukes of, of, of Tuscany, Francesco I. And in 1590, by Ferdinando I. And then there was porcelain weapon as well, but... So this is, a, this is the stock of the Renaissance sculpture in, in Dresden for, for Giambologna. It comes from Florence, yes. And I'm really curious whether the, the person who received the gifts was happier with the Giambologna or cheese and, and wine. I mean, <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. I would definitely go for the Giambologna. And I have to say that your Mercury is just, I mean, it's amazing. And I personally find the, the composition just so incredible. And it's like, to me, it's like one of, the most remarkable compositions in history it's, of sculpture. It's remarkable. And what is remarkable as well is the surface, is the this, this sort of patina, which is very, very seldom. It's it's uh, it's the original um, surface of the bronze, this this lacquer. So and it's, uh, also so just difficult to get the balance right that this <laughs> that this the sculpture stands that doesn't yeah, but, yeah it's well balanced. It's yeah, so, so just for the clarity, again, uh, Wallace collection piece is on the right hand side and, and the Drace and Mercury is, is on the left. And yes, two very different objects. Small, uh, they're small. <laughs> and I got really excited. Um, so the Wallace piece is on the right hand side, so that's, that's the rabbit. And I was really excited when I found your cat because they're just so similar and literally they, they look like they came from the same workshop. And for me, it was really useful to, to know that you say it's a German piece because we were not sure about the Wallace piece, whether it was from Germany or from Spain. But, yes. Sorry. No, no. Yes, we, we think it's, it's, it's a German one because they, they were made after a German woodcuts at the time. So uh, second half of the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us something about the pearl? Because it's so... yes, I think that's what is striking is not the, the animal, but it's the, the, the sort of pearl. This is this irregular Baroque pearl, which is which was very seldom and, and very rare. And, and it was also um, a symbol of power and a symbol of, 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 of wealth to show um, these, um, these pearls because they came, they come from either Sri Lanka, India, or the Caribbean. So they have got a long, a long way to, to, to come to Europe. And what, I think what is important as well, these, um, these uh, pendants, they were either um, worn um, 
as a as a necklace mm -hmm. or they were sewed on the clothes and when if you wear such a, a pendant this is a sort of um of communication of non-verbal communication it's a symbol so mm -hmm. there was no um they always had a a significance when when people wore them so that it could change in the context but it was a statement and if you wore a baroque pearl it's also a statement that you can afford it yes and i think it's still a statement in the 19th century and i we didn't have really have any doubts about this uh pendant so the one in the world's collection we, we always believe it's it's a genuine piece but we have more examples of renaissance jewels or renaissance style jewels mm -hmm. and sometimes it's very difficult to say if it's something original from the 16th century or 19th century because this jewels became so fashionable in the 19th century and lots of fakes were made or sometimes some um, old jewels were recycled or gems yeah. and yeah. it's really difficult to date them but i yeah. think here yeah here we can be we can be sure i think so Wallace got that right, but he not always got these uh, acquisitions right. So, and that's a good example. Um, so there is this cup, coconut cup, and the Wallace piece is on far right. And it's in the style of the earlier cups, but in fact, this one is made in the 19th century. Um, but you have some fabulous Got, pieces. Yeah, yeah, we have got two. Uh, we have got a lot of. I, sh I just sh showed two. A, a German one. Um, this is the the goldsmith who did the ostriches. Um, mm -hmm. who worked for the for the um, for the um, Saxon court in Dresden. Uh, Elias Geyer from Leipzig, and and he used the coconut in a polished way. And if you look at an example of uh, the coconut cup of Amsterdam, and and to say that we have got very few objects which are not German. So the, 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 the emphasis on the silver collection in the green wall lies on Augsburg, Nuremberg, German silver, and a few works of, of, of Flemish or Amsterdam. So this is not, this is one, and it's, it's an incredible piece. It's an incredible early piece, stated 1572 by the Hallmark. And, and if you look um, closely at the depiction, it's an uh, Old Testament scene, really richly carved. So it's it's a very, a very good um, good quality piece. And it's like an ultimate Kunstkammer piece because you have an example of Naturalia, you have the coconut. Yeah. And of course, then that was considered uh, rare and precious enough to make this incredible silver yeah. mount for... for yes. Yes, and the thing is with the with the coconut piece, even we know that it it, it has been. Not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think the Amsterdam piece could have been in the Schatzkammer at the very beginning. So it was not in the in the Kunstkammer, but in the Schatzkammer. So it was very rare. It, yes, yes, as you said, Ada. And here, the last pair we we have, and again, uh, the Wallace piece is on the right hand side. The Dresden um, figures are on the left, and. And again, it's the Wallace piece is in the style of earlier uh, silver figures, but it's in fact a 19th century object. And we call him a tinker because <laughs> there are all these metal objects that hang from, uh, from the figure's neck. Um, but they also include original 16th century medals. And I think it's a bit mix of different motifs because yes, you have a tinker, but actually what he has on his back is this barrel with grapes. And that's yes. very clear in, in your pieces, Teresa. Yes, I think they look very, they look a little bit strange. They, they look even a little bit 19th century to tell you, but they are not. So mm -hmm. they, they have got wine barrels. They are called Bittenträger in, in German and they, um, Yes, they were made of silver and, and, and wood, and they, um, they uh, were made in regions where they cultivated wine. So this, uh, our piece, they come from, is may, maybe marked in, in Frankfurt, and it was not in the Kunstkammer at, at the very beginning. It was in, the, in, a, in a sort of um, um, little, um, at, at the, what is the name? Uh, it, there was a vineyard near, near Dresden, and in a winery, it was it was located in a in a winery, and then it came uh, in 1672 um, in in the Kunstkammer, and then it was it came to the to the Schatzkammer to the Grünes uh, Grünes Gewölbe. 
yeah that they are they are very strange and they are uh, and they were very um popular also in the 19th century as you told and could were... you, uh, explain the name so it's a button trigger so that means button is a barrel uh, it is carrying the, the barrel on his, on, the, on their back mm. Right. Okay, Teresa. I mean, it's such a pleasure to to talk with you, and I, I know we could continue for hours because because the whole concept of the Kunst und Wunderkammer is a huge subject and it's really complicated. But we only very briefly summarize it, uh, and we have so many more pieces in common. And it was really difficult to make this. <laughs> it was difficult to make a choice. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm afraid we have to stop now. So Oli, uh, we are very happy to to take questions. <laughs>